ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country and around the world, I am very happy and honored and humbled to have a very special guest joining us, a man that I have known uh, casually, indirectly, in passing, admiringly for many, many years, uh, a guy who I think continues to be a really important voice of, of reason and conscience, especially in these crazy and dynamic political times, and also just a fascinating human to talk to and interact with and, and be friends with. The great and powerful Paul Bagala finally joins us on Independent Americans. Welcome, my friend. Paul, thanks for, for having me. I appreciate it. You know, I was trying, I don't know when we first met, because we've been in passing probably in CNN hallways and other places, but was it maybe when you were, when we first got in direct contact, when you were helping my friend Tommy Sowers out? I think so. Yeah, so, Tommy, a uh, uh, nearly perfect person, you know, a uh, uh, <laughs> heroic soldier, a terrific professor. Now he's a Duke, I'm sorry to say. Right. Uh, <laughs> but he ran for Congress uh, and it, it did not go well back in uh, Cape Girardeau, Southeast Missouri. Not uh, He ran as a Democrat. He is a Democrat. And uh, not, but yeah, but he, he gathered a really eclectic group of supporters for a really impossible mission <laughs> yeah yeah and I mean, you the, were show there. Called, the show is called independent americans i wonder how it might have been different if he had run as an independent because he was a green beret west point yeah. professor who ran as a democrat in rush limbaugh's home district right and and, and put slaughtered. up a heck of a fight but 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 got beat pretty pretty badly right 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 he did everything right except he, he picked the wrong district yeah, maybe yeah. just they're not going to elect a Democrat in Southeast Missouri. And, and in a statewide office, you know, maybe maybe he fares better. Right. I mean, you know, now we've got talking and we're already jumping into this so much. I want to cover. I want to cover, you know, the, the national political scene. I want to cover the media. I want to cover Biden and, and how he's doing. Mm -hmm. I'm really uh, uh, excited about getting your insights on the topic we've explored a lot. Independent politics in yeah. America, unaffiliated it's the state of the parties. Um, but but bringing it all the way back, uh, I ask every guest, Mr. Begala, where are you and how are you? It's been a wild year. Where are you and how are you and the people close to you after one year of this pandemic and everything else? Well, thanks. I am in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, uh, 100 miles from D.C. It may as well be a million. Uh, the county where I am sitting, 71 percent of my neighbors voted for Donald Trump. Uh, and I think that's good for the soul. We, we have this farm. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Texas. My wife is an army brat, but she her family were dairy farmers in Wisconsin. So it was always our dream to have a little farm. And when COVID hit, we moved out to the farm full time. And we did two things. We moved out to the farm and we drove to Texas and picked up Nana, my wife's mom, uh, who's 83. And just, you know, people make mother-in-law jokes. She's the joy of my life. We, mm. My wife and I've been together since we were 19. So she's known me nearly all of my life. And, and I call her mom. So she's moved in with us. Uh, and she's got disability challenges that uh, require uh, caregiving. And so my wife's taken that on. And it's just been great. I hate to, I, I feel guilty saying this, but like the, we have four boys in their 20s. They come and go, but they come. And we literally were working the farm where my wife's got chickens and ducks. I've got two Texas Longhorn steers I bought as a gift to myself. Uh, a couple of goats. And anyway, we, we, we're living the dream. We're loving it. Uh I love it. I love it. And, and for folks that want to watch the video, you are fully adorned in Longhorn gear. You got the polo yeah. shirt on and the hat. Uh, I had to ask you if you were in Texas because you're so deeply connected to there. And I want to get into that. But you were you were raised in Texas. I think mm -hmm. you come from a Hungarian American family. Yes, too, like I do. Right? Yes, I didn't. Really, you're Hungarian. Yep. Yep. My grandparents, been? Two, of my, two of my grandparents came from Hungary. And do you know and, where? Uh, yeah. Uh, outside of Budapest in a place called St. Goodhart that actually is no longer there because it got annihilated in the bombings during the war. Oh, God, This is a crazy story, but, uh, but we uh, both have, you know, that, that connection. Um, yeah. but going I, I've, I've been back. I, the, the, the Begalas, as they're called over there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it came from a little town called Sharash Potak, which means muddy brook. And there's a little Creek there and it's muddy, but it's in, it's up by the Slovakian border. There's another little town. My folks come from called Shatoraya Wilhelm. And that's right on the Slovakian border. They were uh, peasants and they grew grapes and made wine. And uh, I've been there I, 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 right to where my great grandparents came. My grandmother emigrated mm -hmm. and her family. Were there, and it, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful there. It, um, it, it really is. I, one of the joys of my life was I, I got a chance to take my mother there for the first time. It was the first time she'd been to Europe. Mm -hmm. She went back, went back to the place where her mother was born. But I think that immigration story 
Uh, and, you know, I, I love the accent because I hear my Nana in your accent when you uh. say the names of towns, right? And she spoke Madhyar when I was growing up in the house and we had, you know, all the food. But that, that immigrant experience, I, I never really appreciated how much it shaped my understanding of America until maybe the last right. five years or so. And that's really, you know, formed like a spine of my understanding of patriotism and country. But I want to get to a question I ask of all our people. Way, way back, Machine, you're growing up in Texas, uh, you know, and, and we'll talk a lot about Texas today. What was your first car, Paul Vigala? Oh, my God. My first car was great. You're going to be jealous. It was a 1970 Chevy Malibu, red, two-door, dueled out, that I bought from my high school buddy Stan Brzezink. Um, his girlfriend, Kim, kind of came with it. She liked the car better than Stan or me. So I dated Kim for a little while, but I kept the car for a long time. And of course, the car had a name. He was, his name was John Henry. And he was like, for a small town boy in Texas, this was the loudest, pretty fast car, but it was louder than it was fast. Can you imagine rolling up now that I'm a dad rolling up in front of a girl's house at age 17? I, I, I was working at the hardware store saving my pennies. And uh, my dad took me down to the First National Bank of Stafford, Texas, where Mr. Broom was the vice president. I still remember sweating bullets. And he loaned me the kingly sum of $1,200. I saved $300. And the car was $1,500. And Mr. Broom lent me $1,200, which I dutifully paid back from my earnings at the hardware store. That, that did not disappoint, Paul Begala. <laughs> it was a great car. I'd give anything to get John Henry back. <laughs> well, and I love that it has a name. My, my kids have named uh, my car slash truck. All the cars have names and, and they've called it Black Jack Thunder is what Ooh. they've called my, my car. Uh, and all our cars have names. But let me ask you, John Henry, what shade of red was it? Was it like an Alabama red or what, what shade of red? A was little, John- little browner, a little had a little more. I hate to say maroon because that's the rival school, Texas A&M. It's the uh, remedial college we have. Uh, <laughs> it's so cute. They, they're just the sweetest little people. But it's, it wasn't maroon. It was red, but it had a little more of that kind of brown uh, hue to it. Mm. And, and oh, my God, that car was just just the best. Okay, so the other question I've got to ask, ask of all of our guests, you're, you're taking a sip also from a Longhorn glass. Like they should, <laughs> I'm easy to buy for, Paul. They, they, should, they, <laughs> should, they, should, they should pay you for the sponsorship. But uh, what, what is your drink or cocktail of choice, Paul Begala? Oh, definitely Shiner Bach beer. It's a beer from Central Texas. It's only brewed in Shiner, Texas by the Cosmo Spetzel Brewing Company since 1869. It is the best stuff in the world. It's a nectar of the gods. Uh, occasionally I brew my own. We grow some hops on the farm. Uh, I, my, my, uh, uh, my brother-in-law is, a, he's a, he's an engineer and a genius and a scientist. So he was teaching me how to brew. And, and, uh, once in a while we'll, we'll brew some beer of our own here with our homegrown hops, but that's special. Every, my everyday beer. And it is every day. Uh, <laughs> Shiner Bach. I, I love Shiner Bach. Every time I go to Texas is one of the first things I get. Um, you know, I have, I feel like every time I'm in Austin, I have to go to the continental and have a center Oh, oh my God. Like the one, continental one my I, I had some great dates with my wife there and oh. back when she was my girlfriend, I think, uh, oh my gosh, we got to get, we, we need to take a road trip. I, my son, Billy lives in Austin and, uh, uh, my son, Charlie is visiting him there right now. And I have tons of family in Houston and Austin. And I go there as often as I can. I haven't been in a year, but uh, I, I go very frequently. I, I love Texas. I went frequently in my work at IAVA. I probably went to Texas more than almost anywhere else in America. Um, and, and when we take this show back on the road again, I want to do a live show at the Continental. I want to do live shows uh-huh. in other places. Maybe you can come and join us. But let's stay on the topic of Texas. I want to bounce around a little bit. But um what the hell is up with Texas? Texas is such a great place, right? I'm a New Yorker. I have pride for my state. I love Texas, one of my favorite states. But it, it, Texas is too great to have such terrible leadership in Cruz and Cornyn and Abbott. And now you've got uh, you've got Matthew McConaughey maybe throwing his yeah. hat in the ring. We had Darren Walker on this show. I tried to encourage him to run. Uh, but like on a no shit, sir, like this – this kind of is a reflection in some ways of what's wrong with our politics. Like, right. why can't Texas do better than these three knuckleheads? That's a great question. First, I, I, I have to confess, Darren and I are college buddies. And so we go back 40 years almost. And I loved him then and love him now. And he is one of the most extraordinary Americans. If you had known Darren in college, this is the early 80s. He was straight out of Brooks Brothers. Every day, impeccably dressed. I thought he was a rich kid. 
Mm. His mother used to get hand-me-downs from the rich folks in town and put him in it. And he, he was, even then, he was impeccably turned out. He was really a uniter. Uh, and, a, and a, you know, we weren't terribly divided then, but it was still, it was not as bad as today, but still very much wanted to bring people together and had a great faith in the power of the arts to transform. Uh, I was in student government. I was a little more conventional. This is why Darren will never run for office. I promise. He, he changes the world in, I think, really sustainable ways by being outside the political system, essentially, and leveraging it. Um, but like one of the things he did, how subversive is this? He brought Palabolus, a dance troupe, to the student union. And everybody's like, okay, fine, it's dance, whatever. They danced naked. We had naked dancing in the student union because of Darren Walker. It was so great. And the, 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 cause, and again, he was just uniting. He wasn't a radical. He was like this really lovely, interesting, brilliant guy who was always wanting to push the envelope because he thought, well, it's, I mean, it was, it was not pornographic dancing. It was a, mm-hmm. a very respected dance troupe. A part of their show was without clothes. Uh, anyway, Darren's the best. I'd vote for him tomorrow, but he'll never run. Matthew May. Uh, and, and that would be interesting. But I, I think what's going on in Texas is it's always been a one party state. You know, you're talking about a third party or independent. I, I just want a second party. Mm. Um, since my, I told you my son, Billy lives here. He was born in 1995. That's a long time ago. He's 25 years old. About, uh, yeah, 25. And in those 25 years, the Democrats in Texas have won zero statewide elections. Zero. Ever. Not for railroad commissioner, agriculture commissioner, comptroller of public accounts, nothing. They're O for life in the last 25 years. So I don't think there may be something wrong with Brand D in Texas. Mm-hmm. Begin with my party has to look at itself. They started to become competitive. Beto O'Rourke almost did it, um, running against Ted Cruz. But then you saw they fell way back. MJ Hagar, a veteran, badass. Billy worked for her. I'm biased. Uh, a, a wounded combat hero uh, and very much embodies, I think, true independence. She's not like a hardcore partisan. Right. But she got whipped mm-hmm. by John Cornyn. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly interested in what the Republicans do wrong. I can't affect that as much as what the Democrats do wrong. So I watched the returns and it's, it's the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, where I've spent a lot of time. I go hunting there. It's the most democratic place in Texas. Hillary Clinton won these counties by 50 and 60 points, a margin of 50 or 60. Not that she got 50 or 60. She got 80, 85. Biden won them by like two, Mm -hmm. three. It's the biggest collapse anywhere in America. The biggest partisan swing anywhere in America is in the most Democratic part of Texas, gone from Democrat to Republican. Why? I have to say privately, I call Carvel. I thought it was fraud. It wasn't. It wasn't. But when you see that big a swing, you think, hey, somebody's cooking the books. I was totally wrong. And I didn't say it in public, I'm glad, because I don't want to make un- unfounded accusations. But that was my first, because it was so crazy. It was such a fall. No, it was real. So I looked into it. Uh, I, I called Billy, who was working there. I called Carl Rove, who is an old friend of mine, a premier Republican in Texas and maybe in America. Uh, and then I got the University of Texas to organize a focus group for me of students and recent graduates of UT Rio Grande Valley. So young people, not wholly represented, but the smartest, youngest people there. And this is what they told me. To a person, my Democratic son, my Republican friend, uh, Rove, these independents that the university gathered for me. They said, first off, the Democrats said they were going to ban fracking. And that's, that's one of the few. There's, it's the poorest place in America. And there's only a couple of ways out. The military, mm-hmm. the border patrol, fracking. And you guys were against all three. Now, I can argue, I know Joe Biden actually wasn't, and I, I, it, but this was the caricature my party allowed to thrive, not just exist. It was like a prairie fire it went through there. Mm-hmm. Um, when you, so when you denigrate people who put on a badge and risk their lives uh, to secure the border, we have to secure the border, no question. When you uh, insult people who work in fracking, who say, I'm going to ban all of it tomorrow, which is nuts. You drive people away. Mm. And there was a final piece. And I did see those things coming. I did. It's a final piece I did not see. Democrats were a little too sanctimonious and smug about shutting down the economy. Okay, we, I think we had to do it. I think it saved lives. But it was painful. 
And I had one young person say to me, you know, my dad risks his life every day anyway. Mm. He's climbing up on a hot tar roof. Mm. So he climbs, he risks. So people like me, right, who, who, who can't work at cable television, right? It's easy for me. I can do it from home. I never risk my life. It's not like Anderson Cooper is going to punch me in the face. <laughs> so we are so removed from their lives that we were not sufficiently respectful of people who were already risking their lives every day. And so uh, uh, an invisible virus was not like the greatest threat in their life. Right. And we were tone deaf. I'm not saying we shouldn't have lockdown. We had to save lives, but we were too tone deaf hmm. about the, the, the pain and, and too sort of smug and judgmental and smarty pants about it. So, Paul, we've talked a bit in this show about how Texas in many ways is, is maybe a mirror or a warped mirror into where America is right now, right? It, 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 maybe a bent mirror. We could stretch that analogy. But, you know, w Carville obviously made some comments this week that's gotten a lot of attention where he yeah. said Dem the Democrats have a wokeness problem, right? And you're getting at some of this as well. I think they've got a toughness problem. They've always been right. losing on national security and defense. Now, maybe they've started to change that with people like MJ Hagar and Buddha Judge and Tammy Duckworth. But there's a kind of a core toughness problem that you've been battling, you know, your entire time as a Democrat. I'm an independent. And when I heard Carville, you know, how do you change this? He had, you know, he said they got to pick up the phone. They got to do. What about you cha changing it by blowing it up? And what I mean is. Uh, the Democrats have been kind of middling around the edges, trying to change their messaging, playing with people like Beto O'Rourke. Um, is it not maybe just swooping in and doing a Trump and saying, hey, McConaughey's our guy. He's got star oh. power. He's got toughness. He's got sizzle. He's got energy. He will be bipartisan. And if they don't, like mm -hmm. is McConaughey, let's use him as an example, right? Jesse Ventura, so many others. Mm -hmm. If he runs as an independent, does Texas no longer become a one party state? Does that blow it up? It's fascinating. Uh, Matthew's a friend of mine. He's a very smart guy. Uh, he's a brilliant actor. He loves Texas. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't know if he's going to run. I have no idea. And I haven't talked to him about it. Um, but maybe we like double conditionals in Texas. He might could pull it right. off. Um, I can't see anybody else doing it. It's, I think, uh, sort of a lightning strike, the way Schwarzenegger was in California. California doesn't elect Republicans, but there they put, and by the way, he was a very independent progressive Republican. Yeah. And I don't live there. It's not my state, but I think he did a good job. He seems to be a good guy. I don't know. Him. But that kind of much less partisan, but still, well, unifying, not dividing, but not judging. Right. Um, maybe, maybe, but he's going to have to flesh out the, the, this is like the fundamental problem though, with, with an independent political movement is that some of us are like me. I'm a Democrat. I'm not an independent. I'm not even a little independent. Now, I have in my life voted for a Republican. I voted for John Warner once, uh, who was former Navy secretary, great guy, good man, and yep. a Republican senator. He was just a fine man and a great senator. But in the main, that's the only one I can think of. Uh, maybe by accident, I hit the wrong button. But I am a Democrat, Democrat, Democrat. Uh, and of course, there are people who are Republicans that way, who are just really hardcore partisans. That doesn't leave very much in the middle. I know people say, if you do a poll, Everybody says they're, they're independent, like 45% or something. Yeah, but how do they vote? We just had 93% voting for either Team D or Team R. Well, let me ask you this, Paul, if I can, right? What we're seeing is, you know, 40% plus of the country calls themselves independent or unaffiliated, yeah. a growing percentage. A lot of folks are leaving the Republican Party now. For a long time, folks have said America is kind of a center-right country. Mm -hmm. Maybe now it's a center-left, but I think you have a center, and McConaughey right. could be not unlike Trump. I mean, Trump was independent unto himself. He had his own movement. He had his own brand. He blew up right. the system. Right. So are, are they and both- And Trump tried to run as an independent a couple right. of times right. and failed. But they, but they both go back to the default because you can't run as an independent unless right. you're independently wealthy, unless you're Bloomberg or Forbes or somebody like that. But does that change with other X factors like celebrity or like unity, if you run McConaughey and The Rock and Oprah and five or six other people, and they all say, screw the parties, and they're able to independently fund, and you've got campaign finance reform, and you've got uh, ranked choice voting, and you've got public financing, do all those things come together uh, to create more viable candidates? Somebody told me once, Paul, if you run a vet, a cop, or a coach, it gets you five points in a congressional election. 
Now that was probably a while ago, right? Before cops and other folks had different <laughs> brands. But but there was there's that populism, right? That, right. That, that maybe is stronger than ever before. So is that another way that it could get blown up? If if Colin Powell had run as an independent, there are other examples along the way. If a couple of them get together at this moment, does that blow this up in a way it hasn't been blown up before? No. <laughs> no. It's like they, they, people say they're independent, but they don't vote independent. It's like I could say I'm a vegetarian, I'm right. a vegan, and feel virtuous, but my ass is going to Whataburger. But is that because you don't have the option, right? If, if McConaughey's on the ballot, right, and you have an option, yeah. like, like a lot of folks are independent because they're none of the above. And, and you guys have been great about recognizing the flaws of the Democrat brand, Democratic brand now, Republican brand has got a problem right now. Ooh. It's not an option in most places to even fight, you know, vote for an independent. If, if there are, right. if there is that option structurally. And just because the that- market's not there. Okay. I believe I'm an institutionalist. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a proud citizen of the oldest democracy in the world, a proud member of the oldest political party in the world, a faithful member of the oldest Christian religion in the world. I've been married to the same girl for 31 years. I'm an institutionalist. Okay. That's me. That's how God made me. That's how I'm wired. That's how I choose to live my life. Right. Um, and most people are not that way. Okay. I understand that. I really do. But parties, I like, I've worked all around the world. I've worked in multi-party democracies and they flourish and they thrive. They drive me crazy, but they, they do work. So I'm not saying it's an impossible uh, uh, model. They, they seem to work better in parliamentary systems, if you ask me, you know, Israel. But even there, they, Israel can't decide what they want to do. They got like 20 parties. Um, so it, I don't know that that fixes everything, but parties can remake themselves. This is where independent pressure matters. Okay, uh, I'm in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna turn 60 years old. When I was born, the Democratic Party was the party of segregation. It was the party of the Ku Klux Klan. It was the party of lynching. It was the party of the most evil forces in American history. My party, my beloved Democratic Party. Guess what? In my lifetime, we elected Barack Obama. Mm. Parties can change. Mm. Okay, when you go from the party of being Bull Connor to the party of being Barack Obama, something's happened. And so I believe parties can revivify themselves. They can change. Um, the Democrats are going through this right now. In some ways, wonderful. In some ways, not. The wonderful ways is they are really embracing the diversity of America and its richness. And this is something my right-wing friends don't get. They think that I'm for diversity because I'm politically correct or guilty. I'm none of that shit. Okay, I'm not guilty about shit. And, and as you know, I'm a, I'm a gun-owning, faithful Christian who loves the diversity of America. Why? Because I benefit from it. Okay, but I just had a doc kind of precancerous thing off my face. He's from Iran. I just had a dentist do my checkup. She's from Brazil. The lady across the street from me, who was one of my dearest friends, she was a boat person, came from Vietnam. They were set upon by pirates. She literally had the clothes on her back. You know what? She graduated first in her class at the University of Virginia. She's a freaking genius. I win from that diversity. That's what's great about the Democrats. Yeah. Okay, they've embraced that. I get, I get that, Paul, and, I, and I, I've, I've been long an advocate of, you know, the military is no, no better example of why diversity is a strength, right? Right. But, but, but back to a core question. Yes, it's changing. Yes, it's changed. You're 60 years old. Is it changing fast enough for this America, right? Because the 25-year-olds may not be willing to wait that long and they can get 95 things, you know, 90 different kinds of the same chair on Amazon, but they only have one candidate to choose from. Is, is the earth moving under the parties in a way that they are slow to recognize because, and let's talk about, you know, an increasingly independent part of this country, white men don't feel like they are welcome in the democratic party. Many of them that are, you know, left of center are not happy in the Republican party. So that, and especially when you talk about national security issues like that, Mm -hmm. there is a a political jump ball that, that exists. And it seems increasingly young people aren't willing to wait. So, so does that, does that, does that kind of create a different level of urgency and different opportunities, especially at the local level where they don't have to pick a party? Or you go to a yes. place like Maine, right, where you, where you have different structures. Yes, and and I think that's great. And then the parties then either adapt to that or they die. Right. Okay. Ross Perot got nineteen percent of the vote. One out of five Americans voted for yeah. Ross Perot. You know how many electoral votes he got? Zero. Not a single one. So he effectively really got nothing. But what he did was pressure the winner, Bill Clinton. Yeah. Uh, uh, Perot was a hawk on the deficit. 
And Clinton was a little more moderate on the deficit. He promised to cut it by half. Guess what? He eliminated it entirely, in part because he was persuaded it's good for the economy, but also it's good politics. He wanted to eat into that Perot vote, and he did. Second time Perot ran, he got half as many votes because Clinton had kind of taken his half back. So they, they can have, independent movements, independent candidates can have a, a salutary effect. But Teddy Roosevelt might have been the greatest politician in American history. He couldn't win as an independent. OK, so if he can't. Yeah, Matthew but that, I appreciate you know. I appreciate the examples. And I want to do like a series just on this with you. OK, because I've been so looking forward to having you here to talk about this because of your mastery and because of your experience. But but maybe it's the wrong goal. Right. It's like, is Evan McMullen winning the presidency the right goal or is it right. having all your local mayors be independents? Right. Having your judges be independents, like starting with mm -hmm. the grassroots, starting mm -hmm. locally, because all politics is local. Right. And, and maybe this will transition into into where we are with Biden, because I think we've got maybe the most moderate person since Clinton. Right. And mm -hmm. maybe the most progressive policies and, right. and agenda since FDR. Right. This is a moderate who's going to get through covid, probably get through infrastructure. He's going to introduce pre-K nationwide right. this, right. this week. So, um, you know, there's a really interesting moment happening right. with a progressive guy, with a moderate guy who might be the last moderate we see for a while or he might be the future for the Democrats. We don't know. But can you can you step back and, and objectively evaluate Biden's first hundred days. Tell us what you think for America, not yeah. as a partisan, but as a guy from Texas, a father of four, evaluate his first hundred days and the speech this week. We know what he's going to say. We know what he's going to do. Um, talk, can, you, can you break that down from your perspective, please, Paul? Yeah, he has been remarkable. And, I, you know, I voted for him, obviously. I'm a Democrat and I've known him a very long time. Um, but even I, who supported him, thought he would be a transitional figure. Instead, he's been a transformational president. And I didn't see that coming. And I, I think it's exactly what you say, Paul. He reassures moderates with his demeanor and his, you know, his respect, his empathy, his caring. And he excites progressives with his agenda. I think it's not for nothing. Here's my bias, and I do have my biases. He's the first Democrat who's been president, who went to a state school since Lyndon Johnson. Wow. Okay. And I love President Clinton's my hero. He went to Georgetown. He went to Yale. Barack Obama went to Harvard and Columbia. And it, they're all great. And I love everybody. I, I respect those schools. I tremendous respect for those schools. But you know, you learn something at Delaware, in Newark. You learn something in Austin. You learn something in Ann Arbor. You learn something. You know, Fritz Mondale just passed away. He went to the University of Minnesota. And there is a I, I hate to went to school, say, went to school on the, went to school on the GI bill. Right. Right. And, and you got, you also got Biden as the first uh, president who's had a child in combat in a generation. Right. right. And so he is rooted um, in the non-elite America in a populist time. That's important. So he has a, an authentic sensibility, you know, my hero, president Clinton, he's, he used to say this, he, you know, his father died before he was born. His mother went to study nursing so she could support the family and left him with his grandfather in Hope, Hope, Arkansas, where he had a little general store. It's the only person in a segregated town who would serve black people, and white people equally was Bill Clinton's grandpa. And Clinton used to say, my grandfather never finished high school, probably never went. He said, my grandfather taught me to look up to the people other people look down on. You know, that's what the Democratic Party needs. It's the Republicans need, but I'm not a Republican. Too many Democrats want to look down. You talked about those white men. OK, we want to be too many Democrats are, are more comfortable in the faculty lounge than the factory floor. Hmm. OK, and I come from a different Democratic Party. You know, my parents, we were certainly not poor, but they were very we were right in the beating heart of the middle class. You know, my old man sold pipes and drill bits and stuff. He was a salesman in the oil patch. Yeah, my mother never even went to college until her fifth kid went. She raised five kids and then she started college. Um, so I, I, I come from those folks. And my, my little town, Sugarland, Texas, was really right wing. Our congressman was Tom DeLay for 20 something years. So I grew up with people who today have a Trump flag in front of their house. And I love them. And that's like one of my tests. This is where I think your movement is really important. I want more independent voters rather than nonpartisan candidates, right? In other words, my test is, 
you have to know, respect, and yes, even love someone who voted the other way. Okay, if you're a Trump person, you can't tell me, I love this cousin of mine. She voted for Biden. But you know what? I have a lot less respect for you. If you're a Biden voter like me, and you can't say my neighbor across the street still got his Trump flag up. I love that guy. Great guy. Then you're going the wrong way. I think the problem, put too fine a point on it, is not partisanship. It's tribalism and negative partisanship. Okay, so if you, uh, only one of my four boys went to University of Texas, I'm sad to say. But if you ask any of them, one went to William and Mary, one to UVA, one's still at James Madison, JMU. If you ask any of them, even the ones that didn't go to UT, what time is it? They say, daddy, it's quarter to one and OU sucks. <laughs> because Oklahoma sucks. Right. Well, that's negative partisanship, right? They're not just <laughs> for Texas, they're against right. Oklahoma. Because OU sucks. Well, that's, I save that for something really important, college football. I don't squander that on politics. I mean, this week I went on Anderson Cooper's show and praised Liz Cheney. Now, I, I don't agree with Liz Cheney about anything. I didn't agree with her father, her mother. If she had an Aunt Trudy, I'd disagree with her. But she did things that I thought were patriotic, you know, standing up to the, the insurrectionists and the white supremacists. And I have to admire that because her state, by the way, is the most Trumpian in America. Hmm. So you have to be willing, even the most partisan person yep. has to be willing to set that down. But I think what will move them is if more independent voters, if more voters decide I'm not just going to be anti Pelosi or anti McConnell. Yeah. I'm going to be for something. Yeah. That, that's what, you know, I've been, I've been saying a lot, you know, the most powerful party in America right now is no party at all. Right. And, and, and we, we are a group of people that are not necessarily united on much, Right. Maybe we're united on a strong national defense or maybe things that people aren't thinking about, like legalization of marijuana, things that mm -hmm. issues that folks are not necessarily really fully comprehending that might actually unify huge groups of people. But I've, I've, I've said that I think this is an important time for Democrats and especially Biden to communicate to the hardest right people, the folks that are likely to be converted to extremism, to the Oath Keepers to take the hill, because it's kind of like Iraq right. after after Saddam's gone. You got diehards and you either give them a job or they have their gun. And if you don't give them an opportunity to be a part of the future and let them know that they are valued and there's an off ramp to extremism or an on ramp right. to the future, then we're in a tough place. So I wonder, as we have Biden roll out the infrastructure bill, which I think is maybe the most important thing in that whole thing, I would right. rather have an infrastructure bill to fight extremism than anything else, because you give them opportunity, let them build a bridge, give them a way up to be a part of the future. But the question remains- well, I've heard you say this, Paul, sit down your gun and pick up a shovel. That's it. That always, It's worked since the beginning of time, right? right. But, but the question is, can we message that from the Democratic Party and I don't know if if Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg are the future of your party or if AOC and other folks are the future of your party. And that messaging collision is right. is what makes me feel like, you know, you, Carville, they want to kick you guys out, too, and drag it <laughs> further to the right. So so if, if, if I'm going to ask Carl Rove if he ever comes on my show. Right. Um why should I be a Democrat? I'm not a Dem Democrat. I'm, I'm unaffiliated. Let's say I'm 18 years old or I'm 80 years old. Right. Why do you think right now someone should choose to be a Democrat and not stay unaffiliated? Because the Democrats have always been and always will be the party of the strivers, right? The party of the little guy, the little gal, the working person, who Bill Clinton called the forgotten middle class, right? That, that's always been, we created the middle class, the Democratic Party. Right. We created the weekend unions did, but Democrats uh, passed the laws that actually said, no, they can't work you seven days a week. Um, it's always been that we are the engine of upward mobility. And it, it, it you have to have that ladder to climb on. Right. And, it, and I told you about my grandmother from Hungary. She landed at Ellis Island. She didn't have a nickel in her pocket. She never got past probably fourth or fifth grade in, in school. Um, but she she knew she wanted to be free. And, you know, she lived to see her son, my daddy, go to college and be a salesman. Her grandson go to law school and advise a president. Well, and I got to take her to the Oval Office and President Clinton couldn't have been nicer mm. to her. Well, my obligation then, what do I owe for that unearned blessing? People nowadays call it privilege. And I, I understand that. I'm a person of faith. I consider a blessing which is more powerful and unearned. What do I owe? Well, what I owe is the granddaughter of the next immigrant maid who's got the same language skills as my grandmother and the same education level and the same dreams 
as my grandmother. It is the Democratic Party through public education, good jobs, treating working people with dignity, opening up the doors of opportunity to hated, previously hated minorities. Those things are the engines of the American dream. Those things are why we have a Democratic Party. Mm. Mm. There's my commercial. No, I think it's a, it's 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 the question that I think is is really important for anyone who decides to pick a party to answer. Why am I here? Right. Like, why did I choose to fly that flag? Because right. at a time when the symbolism is being is being hijacked in so many different ways. Right. The American flag is perceived differently than it was 20 years ago. Right. Especially among young people. Like I'm finding a lot of people who are having a hard time flying, flying the American flag. And I'm trying wow. to convince them to take it back and say, it's your flag. It's our flag. It's the flag that- I, I wear a flag lapel pin on my uh, suit every single day that I'm on television, every single day that I go anywhere. And I did have one guy, just some guy is an airport or something. It's like, what are you on the other side now? Cause he's a liberal. Right. But that's, that's the problem. Right? My father was buried under that flag. Yeah, yeah. Are you kidding? And that, and that, that's the problem with, with where we are right now. But I, I guess what I'm also, I wanna just pin one more piece on this if I can, Paul. That's a great case for what Democrats have done before, right? And I don't think any Republican is going to say they're not for the little guy or they don't want to support upward mobility. Or they, that's, that, that's what they both strive for. And they're going to pick the points on the board from the past. But the both parties are going to be defined most, most, I think, most distinctly by their leadership. So when you look beyond Joe Biden, if you got to pick one person to be the brand, who's it going to be? Oh gosh, I can't pick just one. I mean, obviously, the, the, the you're vice. You're going to be in that room, man. You might the vice president. No, no, the vice president is the first among equals, right? Okay. She's she's got the the support of the yeah, president, right. the support of the party. I'm not saying she's running for anything else, sure. but I think she's serving very ably right now. She's impressed me. She ran a terrible campaign. She did. Guess what? So did Joe Biden when Barack Obama picked him. She did. Yeah. You know, did. Joe ran twice before, and never got a single That's delegate. Right. So I don't think it's. A, in fact, I think it's a good thing. One of my early mentors in politics was Governor Bob Casey, Robert Patrick Casey Sr., the governor of Pennsylvania. And he had run three times before and lost. And all the smart guys and the Ivy Leaguers used to call him the three-time loss from Holy Cross. And Casey embraced it. He used to say, mm. you know what? The view from the canvas is highly educational. I've been knocked on my ass. You bet I have failed. And if you have too, you know I'm going to be in your corner. I'm going to help lift you up. So anyway, uh, the fact that Kamala ran such but. I, I want to watch and look at that field. Joe Biden won in the most impressive field. I think Democrats have ever put on the, you've talked about uh, now Secretary Buttigieg. Um, if you looked at Senator Sanders, Senator Warren uh, from, you know, coming from the left, if you looked at uh, uh, Michael Bennett, who, who, you know, ran his center from Colorado is much more moderate. Uh, Steve Bullock, the governor of Montana at the time. I get, I get that. I get that, sir. But also, I think Democrats were a lot more impressed by that field than everybody else. <laughs> like with all due respect, right? Like that was, it was a diverse field. There were many viewpoints represented, but I, I still felt like you had a couple of num you know, number eight and nine hitters in that lineup that, 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 that weren't, you know, in they weren't murderers row. Right. And, and I keep looking at how many leaders are, are still on the sidelines. Right. Like our friend Westmore was on this show. Mm -hmm. I hope he runs in Maryland. He, in my opinion, is a once in a generation talent. There are a lot of folks that are still on the sidelines that I think, you know, five, 10 years from now that have been working in, in Katrina. They've been in Iraq and Afghanistan. They've been on the front lines of covid. I think there's like a second tier or third tier coming that's really going to impress us. Kind of like the World War II generation that came home that just frankly has been through more shit right. than this generation of leaders. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But let, let me ask you a couple key questions I ask every, every guest because I don't want you to, to miss these. I ask everybody. This, this show used to be called Angry Americans. They right. say if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. You're a guy who channels anger and other emotions and puts them into positive impact, but you have a, a beating heart and you're an emotional guy. Paul Begala, what, what makes you angry? Bullies. Mm. Bullies, Paul. I fucking hate a bully. Excuse my language. It's the worst thing you can do. Here, I have been blessed. And, and, and uh, I've, I've been, you know, I used to start every day in the Oval Office. I've mm. literally been near the pinnacle of power. And when, when somebody uses power to hurt a vulnerable person, and there's people who have microphones like you who do not use it the way you do to bring people together, to bubble up new ideas, to bring uh, unconventional voices in. They use it to bully. And I hate it. 
And I, I, I just hate it. I, all my life, I've hated a fucking bully. And that's the worst thing you can do. If you have gifts from God, if you have blessings from God, if you have power from people or even from the almighty, and you use that to harm vulnerable people, you're scum. I really appreciate you saying that. So let me ask you a, a general question. There are still a lot of bullies out there. Yep. And a lot of them have microphones. You used to have a show with uh, Ollie North. I did. So I don't know if anybody was a bigger asshole to me on <laughs> television than Oliver North. Is that right? Absolutely. I was on, I think I was on Hannity and he was guest hitting for somebody, but like consistently he had me on his show and he would be an asshole to me. Right. And just, and just, that was my experience. Right. But there are a lot of folks that are rude, that are disrespectful, mm -hmm. that are pushing misinformation to the point where 40% of the Marines won't take the vaccine. Uh, how do we combat that? I mean, ch change the channel. Yes. Get Fox News out of the chow hall, the Marine Corps. Yes. But every time I go to Twitter, I'm like, what asshole are we all talking about now? It's because one asshole left, the biggest asshole of all. Now this swarm has to just talk about another asshole. How do we move past the obsession with giving these bullies so much oxygen? Right. I don't know is the honest answer. Um, I, I think there was a hearing in Capitol Hill this week about the algorithms. These algorithms feed the dark side. Mm. It, it, now, we're all wired to process negative information more rapidly. You know this from the military. Okay, if you're walking along on patrol and there's a little lovely butterfly over there, but then there's perhaps an insurgent over there, I know where your eyes are going to go, Paul. Right? It, that's how we're wired. That's why, that's why we're the dominant species. And so I accept that and I embrace that. But the algorithm, though, takes that negativity to a completely different level. I tried an experiment, Paul. I'm not, I've never been on Facebook in my life. They could, they could abandon Facebook tomorrow. I'd be happy. I couldn't give a rip. But I'm on Twitter. As you know, we follow each other on Twitter. And I'm a reasonably active tweeter. And so I did something. My wife is the best person I know. And, and I, I believe me, I've talked to God about this. And he's told me the only way you're getting into heaven, Begala, is if your wife gets a plus one. She's that good. <laughs> so Diane had this interesting idea for Lent. We're Catholic. I, I always give up something, uh, cursing, which I love, drinking, which I love, uh, and sometimes Twitter, which I love, even though it's bad for me. All three are bad for me. This year, she said, here's a challenge. Post something positive on Twitter every single day. So every single day for 40 days and 40 nights, I posted a tweet that began with three words. People are good. I saw that. Yeah. And here's an example. Well, I, well during the impeachment trial, I tweeted things that I thought were relevant about why I thought Trump was guilty. And it would get like 50,000 likes. I got like 250,000, 230, I think, 230,000 followers. So that's a big deal for me. But that's wholly negative. I think it's valid opinion, but it's a negative opinion. Trump's guilty and here's why. During Lent, I rarely got 100 people to like any of these good news stories. And it wasn't just me blandly saying people are good. It was about kids in a school who chipped in and bought a car for their janitor, right? It was about a Girl Scout troop in Des Moines who formed themselves living in a homeless shelter and then set the record for selling cookies, right? It just leaves there. I believe people are good. I really believe it. I mm -hmm. especially believe Americans are good. And so I wanted to highlight that. And that, so I, I called a buddy of mine, Bill Burton. He was President Obama's spokesman, a brilliant guy and really knows media far better than I do. And he follows me on Twitter. We talk every day. He said, I haven't seen it once. I haven't seen any of them. I said, why? He said, because the algorithm is not promoting it. The algorithm doesn't want you and Bill and my other friends to see good news about strangers. Right. And so I think that's part of the problem. I think that's, that's right. I think that's right. I mean, I appreciate that because I'm, I've been using the hashtag look for the helpers. I love trying that. to highlight helpers, right? Folks that are courageous and going into the fight. And, you know, I've also been, you know, using the hashtag our enemies are celebrating every time Trump would do some dumb shit that would expose our national security. I try to do that. But but I think you're, you're right about that. And I've been trying to add light to the contrast to heat. I think every one of us can make that conscious choice to mm -hmm. you know, fight the algorithm, fight the instinct and try to add light, especially now instead of heat. But let me ask you to build on that with the question I ask of all of our guests. You're a guy who has positivity. You've been through a lot, uh, political fights, personal fights. You're on TV interpreting all this madness for America. Uh, Paul Begala, what makes you happy? Oh, my sons. 
I have the best kids in the world. Everybody loves their family. And I, I, I know that. And I, I respect that, but man, you'll meet them someday. But the, each one, I'm like five, eight, each one is six, one to six, three. They're giants and they're beautiful and they're brilliant. They're all getting into politics, Paul, mm. in different ways, but they're all getting into public service or politics. And they, uh, you know, your kids are still little. And when they're little, it's all like you giving to them. Mm. And it teaches you uh, uh, selflessness. It gives you, I think, a hint of a shadow of a window of the perfect love that God has for all of his children. Mm. And it's hard for me as a human to imagine that. Like much as I love them, that's how much God calls me to love everybody else. So it teaches you about selflessness. It teaches you about patience. But then they cross this Rubicon. They become young men. All four of my boys in their 20s. They're a lot smarter than me. And they're smarter than me about politics, which I've spent my whole life in. I've taught for 20 years. They're really smart. I call them. I told you, like, I wanted to know what happened in Texas. And Billy had to explain it to me. Um, they, they, they are more technologically proficient, obviously. But they're really, they have deep keel. And they care desperately about, especially racial justice. They grew up in the D.C. area. Mm -hmm. Their high school was about a third African-American. They all went to Gonzaga, the Jesuit school on the hill. Yep. In fact, I introduced you to my son, yep. Charlie, the, one the time. The IVA office was right across the street from right. the football field. We used to talk about that. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. And I you ran, I ran into you at the Auburn Pain there right next to yep. the, I could Gonzaga. I could see practice from the old window of the IVA headquarters. Then you yep. saw two of my boys were football players, two were yep. baseball, and one was a rugger. Um, but, but, you know, th that school required service. And it required service first in the community. Mm -hmm. And it's the only school in America with a soup kitchen in its basement. Hmm. So they had a lot of African-American friends and they have, and I grew up in an integrated school and in an integrated town and their perspective. Uh, I, I heard your conversation with Bartundi. Their perspective on race is so much deeper and richer and uh, more sophisticated than mine. And so they're still, they teach me. That's, that's what makes me happy is that I, I, have, I have these very nearly perfect boys entirely because of their mom. As an army brat, MBA, squared away, you know, they're, they're the reason that those kids are so great. And they're, they're, she's the reason they're so tall. My wife's like 5'11". <laughs> I told the priest in the pre canis ceremony, he had us write a sheet of paper what you want out of this marriage. And um, I was really surprised my wife then girlfriend was writing adventure and all this stuff that I didn't really think because she's the stable one. And so I thought, well, that's good. I can give her that. I can give her instability. Um, and I wrote one thing and I filled the whole sheet of paper, tall kids. Hmm. And a priest is like, this is not a game, son. I said, father, if that woman gives me tall kids, I will never leave her. <laughs> and she's done it. She's fulfilled her. But so anyway, I could go on and on. I was we'll, we will go to Austin I want and hang out with my boys and you will love them. I love Austin so much. Uh, my wife thought about moving there for a while. And there's a lot about, uh, you know, I go to Texas all the time. I have so many dear friends there. Um, and I feel like, you know, to the outside of Texas in liberal America, people have this terrible idea of Texas in the same way some folks in Texas do of Democrats. But maybe, <laughs> you know, that whole insight is an insight into the, the road forward. And you've been uh, an incredible voice for for really a whole generation. Like, you know, I grew up watching you and learning from you and uh, and, and being inspired by you. And I think there's, there's a point that I want to make sure I, I, I recognize, which was your kindness. You've always been very yeah, kind. Thanks. You've always been very generous. You've been supporting folks who are trying to make it and trying to make an impact. And that's, that, that's a kind of service that is very noble and very needed right now. And I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, I wish we could do this in person, but I'm going to present you some gifts virtually, right? We used to do it in the classic car club. So we'll take a rain check on that. I got some, <laughs> I, I don't, you probably won't wear it, but I got independent Americans gear. <laughs> Great. Okay. We got new gear. You can rock the eye. I got the shirt on. I had the hat last week. We've also got the righteous shirts that are kind of oh, love that. And cool. Yeah. Wear those in Austin. Um, we've got some uncle nearest, uh, the finest uncle nearest small Ooh. batch whiskey coming your way. The greatest. I'll share that with Carville. The great, you definitely, he, and then and then come <laughs> on my show after you finish the box. He, oh, he'll definitely do it. Yeah, for uh, that, he'll Carville joins it. us soon. And then the last, the, the gift is a question. We just passed Easter. I know you celebrate Easter with your friends, uh, but there are three colors of peeps here: pink, yellow, blue. Paul Begala, which color peeps would you pick, and why? Oh, you got to go blue. I'm a Democrat. See, I'm not an I'm not an independent. I'm a Democrat. I'm going with the blue peeps. 
I love it. I love it. I am so grateful for your friendship, for for your uh, for your contribution to this country, for your stories, man. I hope they do like five more movies about you guys. It'd be great if you if they got you guys. The War Room is that the film that I the, the yeah. film right with so many of y'all. They're doing so many different things now. It would be kind of cool to do a War Room reunion. Have they ever done that? Oh, in the past, but you know, people and have film it. Done. Like it's, after, it's... after you have a bottle, have this bottle, <laughs> and then let us shoot it. <laughs> you know, I, I would say I'm proud of the work I did. I think you and others are leading us into a new greatest generation. I mean mm. that. I look at my kids. You, you know, these service members. I have two of my very best friends, and I won't say who. Two very powerful politicians, and their sons are both on active duty. One's in the Marine Corps. One's in the Navy. Um, you're leading something really important, Paul. And this generation, particularly the young people you talk to, particularly those who are first responders and service members, they're the greatest generation. I mean it. They're part two of the greatest generation. They're, they're more public spirited. They're less partisan. Like They're not like me. They're more like you. But they're, they're more public spirited. They're more selfless. They're more respectful of others. Uh, I just think, it, it, you know, the worst thing I can say is that some of them are a little too PC and empathetic and, you know, the pronoun police and all that shit. Okay. If that's the worst thing you can say is that they're overly concerned with not hurting people's feelings. Mm -hmm. That's pretty great. So I I think we're watching something. I, 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 as I turn 60, I'm more optimistic now than I ever was when I was working in the white house or any other time, because I see what's coming. I really do. I, I dread what's happening and I hate what's happening, but I see what's coming. And uh, I'm not kidding. My sons, your little guys, they're going to save us all. And you're going to be a central part of that. I love that. I I share that optimism. I think there is a next greatest generation, you know, after 9-11 experience in the pandemic, you know, the the war on terror, uh, the insurrection, all of this, like it's, it's stealing them for the future fights. And that's the silver lining in my view. So I do think, you know, they're, they're the next greatest generation. America is a team game and we're all in it together. You're, you're in the Hall of Fame. The draft is coming up, the NFL draft, which I think is like one of the greatest American things to watch yeah. these kids and this and, and the draft is this weekend. So we're going to see a new generation of leaders on the forefront. But you're continuing to support a new generation of leaders. I wish you'd run for something in Texas. Anybody other than these guys, please. I'm, a, I'm an independent, but I'd vote for you if you ran against Ted Cruz. <laughs> But until then, we're going to look for you on CNN everywhere you are. People should follow you on Twitter and follow the good stuff. If you see the good stuff he posts, like it, share it. The great and powerful Paul Vigala. Thank you so much for joining me, my friend, here on Independent Americans. Paul, thanks a lot. Hook him. Stay vigilant. Thank you.